Uh, all right. So I want to start this talk with this uh, beautiful picture of a shadow of a black hole uh, that we've all seen all, all over the media recently. Not because I had anything to do with the Event Horizon Telescope, just because I've learned recently that the techniques that were essential in getting this picture, acquiring this picture, are actually very related with uh, the, the subject of this talk. So uh, like, uh, this talk is going to be about uh, so-called sparse recovery. and. The setting for the sparse recovery is following. We imagine that there is Bob who has some high and uh, n dimensional vector in his head for a high n, for a large n. And we have Alice, excellent, we have Alice who can ask Bob a question uh, that I will call a linear measurement. So Alice sends a vector a1 to Bob and she reads back an inner product between a1 and x. And she can ask another question a2, she reads back the inner product, she wants to make the smallest possible number of linear measurements like that, and eventually she would like to recover the vector x that Bob have. Now, as stated, this is not an interesting problem. Obviously, if she makes n linear measurements, she can recover it. If she doesn't, she cannot. So there's nothing to do here. But what if Alice, in addition to this, knows something about the structure of the vector x? So in particular, one structural assumption that is very common is that vector x is k sparse. It has only k non-zero entries, or is approximately k sparse. So it has only k as like large entries and the, the rest is some small noise. And this is very natural uh, assumption that actually is satisfied by number of uh, signals in real life, either in the like, standard basis that we consider them or after a uh, very simple change of basis. So for example, for a like, arbitrary picture, if we uh, apply a hard tail transform to it, it's going to be approximately sparse. It's going to have only small number of large entries and uh, like apart from this, all the remaining entries are very small. Now, if we knew where are the, the where are the non-zero entries of our vector, then again the problem is not interesting. We can just query them one by one. The question is, what if we what, what to do in the the previous setting if we do not know where are the non-zero entries? And by the beautiful theorem of Donohoe and then Kandish and Tao, you can actually perform sparse recovery in this scenario using only about k log n linear measurement. And moreover, if the vector is approximately sparse, you will get the approximation of your actual vector. So you will be able to recover some, after that many linear measurements, you will be able to recover some vector x tilde, such that the distance from the vector x tilde to the actual vector you're looking for is proportional to the L1 norm of the tail of the all co coordinates apart from top k. So in particular, if the vector is exactly k sparse, this distance to the shortest, uh, to the closest k sparse vector is zero. We are hoping to recover vector x star exactly. So we, we, we want to recover vector x star that is equal to x star in the case where our, uh, x star is exactly sparse. And when there is some dense noise of small magnitude, we should be able, like the, the recovery guarantee should degrade gracefully with the L1 norm of the noise. Now, the way they proved it is uh, like, the way you want to show, solve this kind of sparse recovery problem is first you want to come up, first they came up with the uh, measurement matrix, what kind of measurements you want to make, and then how to recover the actual vector x star given the values of the measurements. So I'm going, like, uh, so I'm going to represent this in a kind of reverse order. One theorem that uh, they proved is that whenever the measurement matrix A satisfies so-called restricted isometry property, I'm going to say a little bit more about what this property is, but, uh, but once our measurement matrix A satisfies this property, then uh, some sort of simple linear program actually will recover vector x star given the measurements, uh, values of the measurements with the error as I promised you on the previous slide. So now the only question is, can we come up with matrices with this restricted isometry property. And what Kandash and Tao proved is that indeed a Gaussian matrix with k log n rows uh, with uh, independent Gaussian entries will satisfy this restricted isometry property with high probability. So those two theorems together give the previous theorem. You can uh, do the, the sparse recovery with this kind of error using about k log n measure, measurements. Now, what is this restricted isometry property? So I promised you that uh, at least for sp exactly sparse vectors, you will be able to recover them without any error. In order to have any hope to do this, at least our matrix 
after restricting to case bars vectors has to be injective, right? So the natural necessary condition to be hope to do any sparse recovery is that our matrix, measurement matrix A, does not have any two case sparse vectors in the, in the kernel. This is equivalent to saying that it's injective or when restricted to case sparse vector. Now, restricted isometry property is fairly natural strengthening of this, of this, uh, of this simple uh, necessary condition. Not only do you not want to have case sparse vector in the kernel, in fact, you want your measurement matrix to be near isometry when restricted to case or two case sparse vectors. So you want, to, you want it to preserve, approximately preserve norm of all the case sparse vectors. This is much stronger than just saying that it doesn't collapse them to zero. And in fact, we don't really care about like, extremely good, good uh, isometry. The distortion, this, this error delta on the order of 0 0.4 is good enough. To, to do this person recovery. Now, uh, the, the question is, are the matrices with this kind of properties exist? And as I said, if you just take a random matrix with uh, Gaussian entries, then using k log n rows, you will, be, you will guarantee this, uh, you get this uh, LAP property. You could ask, what about a little bit more structured matrices? And already in the early works of Kandash and Tao, they showed that if you instead choose a matrix that is, choose a discrete Fourier transform matrix and take a random subset of rows of this matrix, as soon as you are taking about k log n to the six rows, you do have this restricted isometry property again. So that's pretty cool. We actually are interested much more in this kind of uh, structured matrices, specifically uh, subsample discrete Fourier transform than just the completely unstructured matrices for a number of reasons. For once, sometimes you are applying this in actual like, real life. Maybe you are restricted in the domain where you are applying it to use this kind of Fourier measurements because like, they are, like, the measurements are actually being made by some uh, physical device that is making only measurements of this form. From theoretical pr perspective, this is also interesting because the uh, matrix of this discrete Fourier transform comes with an efficient algorithm for matrix vector multi multiplication. We have FFT, we can multiply by this matrix in time n log n. So uh, in particular, the compression can be done in time near linear as opposed to uh, quadratic. And also, even more importantly, because of this fast matrix vector multiplication, the decoding algorithm can be made near linear as opposed to much slower. Just because there are decoding algorithms that are uh, iterative the same way you, we often solve a linear system iteratively. So, you're just applying, multiplying by measurement matrix and it's transpose, and it's transpose uh, iteratively. If you have fast matrix vector multiplication, this, is, this recovery is going to be fast. So we care about the subsampled Fourier matrices and the question is how many rows of the subsampled Fourier matrix do we need to uh, have to guarantee this, uh, this uh, uh, restricted isometry property? And already in the first words, Kandash and Taos said that k log to the sixth n rows is enough. And then a bunch of people was, a bunch of people was motivated by what I said, and they tried to uh, understand what is the exact number of rows, rows we should be using, and they start shaving those log factors. And after a sequence of improvements, we now know that if you sample about k log cube n rows of the discrete Fourier transform matrix, you do have this restricted isometry property. Uh, now, given the sequence of improvements, everybody believes that we just, we'll just keep doing what we are doing. We are, we'll keep doing a good job. Eventually, we'll show that k log n rows of the discrete Fourier matrix, the same number of rows as for the, basically the same as for the Gaussian matrix, is enough for the restricted isometry property. Now, there is a, like, what I want to say in this talk is that there is a little bit of a problem with this. Namely, all of those proofs mentioned here work in much more general setting, where we look at what's, what I'm going to call a banded autonormal matrix. So for me, a banded autonormal matrix is a matrix that has banded entries, like autonormal, autonormal rows, and as small entries as possible given that the rows are autonormal, up to a constant, let's say. And in particular, this kit for transform matrix is of this form. It has all the magnitudes of entries equal to one over square root n. So all those proofs that I mentioned actually are stated in this generality. Whenever you start with a banded autonormal matrix, 
you subsample, say, k log cube n rows of this, you will end up with a matrix that has restricted isometry property. Now, I'm going to show you a different bounded autonomous matrix that's not a discrete Fourier transform. This is a so-called Hadamard matrix or Walsh Hadamard matrix. It looks like this. It has some sort of formula for the, the entry. And the main point here is that this is a, a bounded autonomous for now, we will, we will see a little bit more what this matrix means. But for now, the main, main point is that this is some bonded, bonded autonomous matrix that, uh, yes, this is, uh, this is some bonded autonomous matrix. All the rows are autonomous. All the entries are bonded. And what we showed is that for this specific matrix, if you subsample much fewer than k log square n rows, you will actually have a a sparse vector in the kernel. So not only you will fail to have restricted isometry property, this is going to like, fail to, to have restricted uh, isometry property uh, miserably. So in particular, one way to interpret this result is that uh, if we want to show k log n upper bound for discrete Fourier transform matrix, we need to use something more about the structure of this matrix than just the fact that this is bounded autonomous. So, what we showed is that there is no hope to get anything better than k log square n for subsampling, uh, for LIP property of subsampled matrices if you want to show this for, for all bounded autonomous matrices. Uh, and yes, as I said, in particular, this, this means that those matrices don't have LIP property, but it's much stronger. It doesn't give you any hope to do any kind of sparse recovery if you are sampling only k log square n rows of this matrix or fewer. Now, uh, let, me, let me give you most of the proof, because actually the proof ends up being uh, fairly, fairly cute. Uh, so let's, let's try to go over this proof. And by the way, uh, like during this talk, I am going to think that all those k's and n over k are polynomial in capital N. So let's say that all those log factors are just log n. We want to show that if you sample much fewer than k log squared n rows of this matrix, you actually, with high probability, will uh, have a sparse vector in the kernel. And to prove this, uh, let me start with stating some very simple fact about bounded auto autonomous matrices that I'm going to call a restricted uh, 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 an uncertainty principle. It just st states that the sparsity, whenever I have a bounded autonomous matrix, the sparsity of any vector times the sparsity of its image is at least capital N. So you couldn't have that both the vector and its Fourier transform are, sp are, are very sparse. We are not going to use this fact in this talk, but in order to understand what's, what's happening, we need to have this fact in mind. So here is the high-level strategy for showing the lower bound. First, we want to find a large family script A that has only k sparse vector, but all those vectors are tied for the uncertainty principle. So given the uncertainty principle, the Fourier transform should be as sparse as possible. And I want this family to be really, really huge. I want this family to be of size 2 to the log square n. This log square capital N is going to be the same log square n that's going to end up showing, showing up in our final, final result. Now, we want to use this family to show that actually if I take omega to be a random set of rows of my matrix H, which with high probability, one of those vectors from my family, all of them are sparse, one of those sparse vectors in my family is actually in a kernel of H sub omega. Now, why, like, what does it mean? Equivalently I, could, uh, equivalently, I could state this as my set omega of indices has empty intersection with one of the supports of H A, for one of A's. Uh, or, again, equivalently, if I think of a set system, just combinatorially. I have some set system which consists of sets that for each vector A in my script A, I look at the support of its Fourier transform. If I think about this set system, I want to say that, the, uh, that with high probability, omega is not a heating set for this uh, set system if the expected number of elements in omega is too small. Now, why this is, why, why, why what we are doing actually seems to me make sense. I'm saying that, like, why this construction should be helpful here. I'm saying that I'm going to construct, like, this set system uh, consisting of sets that are support of uh, HA is going to consist of 
as small sets as possible given the uncertainty principle. So I want to say that I have a set system that has uh, very, like, uh, tons of very small sets, and my goal is to show that random set omega uh, should to be very large to be a heating set. This kind of makes sense. If I have a lot of small set, I should need a large uh, set, uh, I should need to sample a large set to be a, a heating set for this set system. So this is the, 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 the strategy. Now, how do we construct this family script A? Let me quickly go over some uh, full analysis of a uh, hypercube. I'm just going to like, say, uh, state those things to, to set up some notation. I'm assuming that some of us have seen this. So I'm going to look at capital N be, being two to the little n, capital K being two to the small k, and instead of thinking of my space of uh, n-dimensional vectors, I want to think of a space of all functions from the hypercube, f2 to the n, to the, uh, uh, to the L line. Those linear spaces are of the same dimension, so they are isomorphic, but this is the way I want to think about this, this space. And in this space of uh, functions from a hypercube to the L line, I have some spe special functions that I'm going to call characters. For each y, I have a character that's given by this, and all of those characters happen to be orthogonal to each other under the, under the, the standard inner product. So uh, I have a decomposition for every function f. I can decompose it as a linear combination of those characters. And this matrix H that I'm talking about is just a matrix of a linear transform that maps the val values of function f to its uh, Fourier coefficients. So I won't be talking about matrices anymore. Let's just talk about it as a Fourier transform on a hypercube. I want to. Uh, so I said that what I want to do is I want to find this family script A. It should be a family, large family of functions that have small support such that their Fourier transform also have small support. Now, here's a fact. Let's think of F, this F2 to the N as a linear space of F2. And let's look at any linear subspace on F2 to the N, in F2 to the N. And let's look at the indicator of this linear subspace. It's not too difficult uh, calculation that the Fourier transform of, of any indicator like this is actually indicator of the orthogonal space. If we just like, look at the dimensions, if, my, if the dimension of my space B is K, the dimension of the co-dimension of the orthogonal space is again K, dimension of orthogonal space is N minus K. If we look at the number of points in those spaces, one has capital K points, the other has capital N over capital K points. Uh, so they indeed multiply to capital N. Those things are tied for uh, uncertainty principle. So this is going to be my family script A. And indeed, this is a large family of vectors. Namely, there is a lot of subspaces of dimension. See, if we think about dimension that's linear in, uh, in the entire dimension of a cube, so say 0 0.3, there is about 2 to the n square subspaces. Just because for every matrix, like you have uh, two to the kn matrices, zero one matrices. For every such matrix, like most of them span some sort of k-dimensional subspace. And uh, all right, so this is the construction of family script A. Now, why this construction seems to be useful? Uh, if we look at this as a set system, if we wanted to. So we want to understand when set omega becomes a heating set, random set omega becomes a heating set for this set system. Uh, we have a set system of co-dimension K subspaces. I'm saying that in, th in terms of upper bounds, if I have a bunch of sets of density delta, then a random set of size one over delta times log of the size of the family becomes a, a heating set with high probability. If I plug in uh, the density is, one of the density is capital K, size of the family is log square N. So if I wanted to do a lower bound, I would actually end up with uh, showing that as soon as my set has, says K log square N, it satisfies, like I, I'm getting a heating set. And now via some second moment argument and simple calculation, you can show that if you are using much fewer rows than uh, K log square N, you are not going to get a heating set uh, with high probability. Okay, thank you.